Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Matthew. Episode 228, recorded for September 20th, 2023. Microsoft and Oracle unite their legal departments to bring you, and you'll find out later. <laughs> Good <laughs> evening, Matt, Ryan, and Jonathan. How are you doing? Hey. Great, Justin. Good. Uh, we might have missed an episode, so if you're out there in podcast land going like, wait, we're, I, we're missed a week. Yeah, sorry about that. Sometimes life happens. <laughs> we, we made the best effort to get on a show out last week, and it just didn't happen. It wasn't going to happen. And we we're like, why are we fighting this? We're just going to push it to next week. So here we are. We will uh, give you two weeks of news in once. So it's uh, it's a win. It's double the episode, mm-hmm. or hopefully the same amount of time. We'll see. <laughs> First up, Amazon has some new instances for you to play with. First up is the R7A, which is powered, powered, of course, by the fourth generation AMD Epic Genoa processor, the maximum frequency of 3.7 gigahertz, which is 50% higher performance compared to the previous generation instance, the R6A. The R7A supports the AVX-512, the Vector Neural Network Instructions, and the Brain Float Point 16, as well as double data rate DDR5 memory. And you can get these in configurations from one vCPU and 8 gigs of RAM all the way up to 192 vCPU and 1.5 terabytes of memory, uh, which is quite a bit. Uh, and if you were like, nah, that's nice, but I don't like AMD and you want to pay more money for an Intel version, uh, there's the new R7iZ instance, uh, which are the fastest fourth generation scalable based Sapphire Rapids instances with 3.9 gigahertz sustained all core turbo frequencies. And the R7iZ has four built in accelerators built, including advanced matrix extension or AMX. Intel Data Streaming Accelerator DSA, Intel In Memory Analytical Accelerator, and Intel Quick Asset uh, Technology QAT. You may need to use specific kernel versions, though, to take advantage of these, so do be careful of that. Uh, you can get these boxes in configurations of two vCPU and 16 gigs of memory, all the way up to 128 vCPU and a terabyte of memory, uh, which is great if you like uh, large, expensive boxes. I just love that the like the features for for the new machine learning instance types when they're announced are like crazy. You know, like I didn't know that B float stand for brain float point. That's awesome. I didn't know that you either. Know? Yeah, <laughs> it reminds me of zombies. It's very it's very uh, Halloween orientated, which we are getting close to Halloween season. So <laughs> I appreciate the brain float point. I don't. Know, it seems like uh, something a zombie would be into. I'm just more impressed. It's still DDR5. I feel like like 20 years ago, I built a computer with DDR. Three or four, so I really feel like RAM. I mean, DDR four was very long in the tooth. Yeah, <laughs> DDR four lasted a very long time. DDR five is actually pretty new, I think. I don't know when it became kind of mass population and servers, but it's been in the last eighteen months. I mean, Jonathan's a little bit more hip into this hardware side; he might know if it's been longer than that. But it does seem like it has not been very long for DDR five. I think it's actually been around for quite a while, but it took a long like the specs been around for a while. But it took a long time to actually be adopted by anybody yeah i think it was a cost problem because the you know the ddr5 i think it was right in the middle of the chip shortages and you know it was a i think they were putting it onto maybe the uh, the graphics cards but they weren't using it really with, with the processors because they didn't need the bandwidth there and yeah it's, it's taken a while so ddr4 was released to the market in 2014 sorry ddr3 yeah. was 2007 and ddr5 was 2020 so you're right in the middle of the pandemic. That's why none of us yeah. knew about it. <laughs> we were we were bunkered down in our houses, all hoping not to get a plague. So <laughs> that's how it goes. And how often do you up, update your home PC anymore, anyway? Or do you even have a home PC anymore? Just a laptop? Yeah, what's that? <laughs> I, I have a gaming PC that I built during the pandemic, to be honest, and I could not get DDR5 memory. I looked into it. Um, but it's I will never upgrade it, probably. It'll probably last me 15 years, because I don't play a lot of really high-end games. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it'll be there. It'll chug away doing just fine. Yeah, I normally get get myself a new PC whenever my wife goes away for a, for a week to visit somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like what every six months. <laughs> uh, it's been a while, but yeah, like you get to a point where what's the point in updating? It's great, so I can get five hundred frames a second. What difference does that make? Yeah, I can't see that well. Yeah, <laughs> I start to realize that the the quality, the quality of the game is more important than the the uh, the ray trace graphics. <laughs> you're you're kind of into VR a little bit, doesn't the aren't the newer video cards better for the VR reality and you know compiling all those bits and bytes and making it so it's not so you know because so sick is not the reason why that's all there. Ah, uh, it helps. It helps with it. I've got a original Oculus 
And so um, I keep, I keep like, do, do I upgrade? Do I upgrade? Do I upgrade? And then the rumors are always out there, like, oh, there's a new one coming soon. So I never upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be like the Oculus 7. And he's oh, like, okay. there's a new one coming out. I'll stick with my Oculus 1. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It'll just die. The original Oculus will die someday. Then I'll have to do something. Yeah. That'll be its forcing function. I don't know if they'll ever go back to like something that's tethered to a, a strong machine. I think that they're very, very much capturing money hand over fist with them. I mean, I think I, I think most of the Oculuses are still tethered. It's only the quests that are not tethered. Mm-hmm. Which... The, te- the quests are way far lower powered than the main ones that connect to your video card. Yeah, I was looking at the HTC one, the Vive, and the Vive Pro, pretty, both pretty nice. But like the delta between what I have now and what that gets me is not enough to make it worth an upgrade just yet. Maybe for the after show, you should tell us what you think about the Apple Vision Pro. <laughs> I'm sure you have opinions. <laughs> right, let's move on back to Amazon. Let's get off this rattle. <laughs> Uh, AWS IAM Identity Center session duration limit increases from 7 to 90 days, if you wish. Uh, this is for accessing the portal session duration for the last 90 days. This will define how long signed-in users can access the AWS portal and Identity Center-enabled applications before being prompted to re-authenticate. Now, for those of you who don't remember what this product is, this is Amazon SSO. So if you would like to have your users get logged into those applications for up to 90 days, uh, you can do that. You can also reduce it down to 15 minutes, which I would totally do to Ryan. <laughs> that would be uh, and the previous maximum you can set this to was seven days. Uh, and, you know, while I appreciate that there's this flexibility, I'm not sure that 90 days is a good security practice, let alone anything more than normal, you know, 24-hour kind of setup for most sessions. Uh, this will not change the default IAM identity center duration, though, which is for the AWS console itself, which will continue to be eight hours. Uh, but you can't configure this if you have this use case. I want to. Yeah, it's such a strange range. I just want to know who put in the PFR at Amazon to say, hi, I want 90 days or I want like 180 days. And this was the compromise. Like, what is the use case that you want to authenticate for that long? So CloudWatch dashboard running on a TV monitor, but they're using an <laughs> OAuth flow. And so they log into it every every quarter. To refresh the session. That's my guess. So authenticate gets the corporate ID unless if they're using Azure uh-huh. or AWS SSO or identity center local identities. Which, they're just making it work, man. They're just making it work. Which means no one remembers the passwords and you're probably hitting your password policy. Yeah. So every 90 days <laughs> you get problem. mad that you have to reset a password. To, you, you try to lock in with whatever post-it note was saved on your desk to then get mad that your password expired and start all over again. Well, so not only are you mad that your password has expired, that you changed, you now have to go to all nine, all the TVs <laughs> that have your dashboard on it and now use that terrible uh, remote to type the password in. Oh. And of course, it's going to be like 14 characters, you know, yeah. special character. So it's going to take you like at least five minutes per TV. Uh, let's be honest. What so. are we, September? Okay, so it might be fall 2023 is probably your password. At this point, maybe summer <laughs> depends on your organization. <laughs> To hit the eight, to hit the eight characters. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to do that math in my head. Yeah, hey, it's the eight characters plus the special character requirement. So you gotta, it's gotta, you know, you hit it with fall twenty twenty three. You know, that was eight, but you need yeah. a bang. Well, unless it's three or four, so you get the capital F, the numbers, and the lowercase. Yeah. Doesn't really appreciate if you stop shouting my password out to the you know yeah. podcast audience. I thought yours was I thought yours was fall with the with the A as an yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That way you were limited to exactly eight characters because <laughs> nine would be too many for Ryan. So well, yeah, well, I, who has time for nine? Yeah. But you know, you, you type it in every 15 minutes. It makes sense <laughs> that you'd only want eight characters. <laughs> so I, yeah, that's that's great too. <laughs> Amazon EC2 M2 Pro Mac instances built on the app, Apple Silicon M2 Pro Mac mini computers. That's a lot of Mac and Mini in one sentence. Uh, are now available to help all of your iOS development pipelines now build Apple iOS applications and packages for iPad and Apple uh, computers. All available to you now on the AWS Cloud. These boxes are 12 core CPU, 19 core GPU, 30 gigs of RAM, and 16 core Apple Neural Engine compute uh, circuits available to you. And remember, if you do use these, you have to pay for the full month because Apple doesn't like cloud. <laughs> Yeah, if these weren't so like ridiculously expensive, I would consider just renting a Mac for my it's personal still, uh, computer. It's still better yeah. than running this underneath my desk, so we could do iOS builds though. So I, yeah, if you have this use case, it's 
still better than anything you were doing before, even if it costs you an arm and a leg. I agree with that. There's some third parties. I know that like you can just outsource your Macs and it's a little bit more reasonable. Yeah, Mac Stadium mm-hmm. and a couple of others. But now yeah. you're now you got another vendor to onboard and go through risk management, POs, credit cards to put in. It's just simpler if it's all part of your thing. And if you're using code build or code pipeline, now it's all integrated into the same network. Like there's a lot of advantages to having this in AWS for you that you don't get with Mac Stadium. But yes, if you're just looking for a build server that's in the cloud, go with Mac Stadium or somebody else who provides this because uh, Amazon's are expensive. But I assume you're listening to our podcast. You are using one of the cloud providers and you probably prefer it to be there. Does anybody know what's up with the 19 GP, GPU cores? Like, it's just a weird number. It bothers me. No, it's an odd number. It really right? bothers it's, me. Yeah. Well, you can email Tim and find out. You know, the way they're binning the M2 and the M1 chips is sort of interesting in general and how they connect the turbo cores and how they designate between the GPU cores versus non GPU cores and the neural link cores. I was listening to a whole thing about it and it got over my head pretty quickly because. Look, the, the intricacies of a CPU, I just want the CPU to work. I don't care how it <laughs> does things. Uh, but uh, it's the yeah, thing that it, makes noise, right? Yeah. 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 It has a big fan heat yeah. sink on it, right? And, it's how Ryan heats his house. <laughs> You're <Yeah>. not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, GCP has a, a lovely article here that they paid McKinsey Research for that found that nearly 70% of the top economic performers are leveraging software for a competitive edge. And given that your software is a crucial differentiator, it's essential to critical resource to make that software. And in the last decade, there are several trends that happened, of course, in imagining the developer experience, like shift left, API first, containers, microservices, and explosion of choices from open source software that have transformed the developer experience. All these changes accelerate value creation for business. They also create new friction points and challenges, like I can't blame my ops team for not delivering. Getting started with any new cloud can be daunting and require significant cognitive investment, and quickly you'll be facing a maze of disparate cloud services and APIs. And as the complexity of building apps grows, developers rarely rely upon disparate and contradictory sources from product docs, product collateral, best practices, third-party third party sites, developer community information, and my outdated Confluence page. Shift Left extends the developer's responsibility to include testing, security performance, and UX assessments. And so Google is uh, committed to a modern developer experience that empowers developers to stay in the flow state longer, shorten the feedback loops, and reduce cognitive load by shifting down all of this work. And we talked about several of these things in the past. And this is why they're, they're really focusing on all of this as well. Now, the fun thing about this article is they really point to a bunch of things that are sort of interesting. Like they call out the door uh, report as a way to help optimize your thing. I'm like, well, that's great. It just tells you how you're not as good as everyone else. It's appreciated. They uh, create and evangelize your internal best practices like SRE, which who doesn't love a good SRE team? They talk about SBOM and SLSA. So, you know, more things for your developer to help you with. Uh, and ultimately, they don't give a lot of advice to how you actually do all the things they're talking about that would benefit you uh, at the end of the day. But they, uh, they say cloud workstations is the center of all of that. Uh, and that is sort of a silly starting place. And then they call it, of course, AI, because who doesn't love AI? And Duet AI apparently is going to keep you in that flow state, which I don't know. And then overall using AI for feedback loops. So overall, it's a good article. It's interesting. It doesn't give a lot of new things, but I wanted to share it anyways because they think they're special. So what exactly does it mean? That they're levering, leveraging software for a competitive edge. And what are the other 30% of people doing? They're not using software. They're using <laughs> yeah. hardware. You know, tablets and, yeah. and chisels, man. Smoke signals. We, we write our to-do lists on, you know, dry erase boards. And then we take a picture and we use SMS text to send it. I don't know. I mean, so it's, I, it's a tool for getting work done is, is what they're talking about. Yes. I have problems with articles like this because it, it it misses on the value of these things. Like if you're going to say cloud workstations, like why is it cloud workstations? And because if you just deploy a fleet of cloud workstations, you've done nothing besides incur a bill. And so well, you got a really nice VDI. Potentially. Well, but what what can it do? Right. Like and, and this is, you know, the people who are pushing VDIs are, are IT orgs who are worried about performance and cost or security orgs who are who are concerned with, you know, control and restricting access and, and possibly inspecting access. But, you know, articles like this, like it's since it's not that's not the focus, they're they're losing that value of that transformation, that developer experience. Because you can actually improve the developer experience. You can make it a global optimization by providing them a tool with the preset environment and all the things already configured and, you know, easy scripts. But no one really does that that last little bit on top of it to make it a service that's a global optimization 
And articles like this do it no service because they're like, yeah, no, these are these are important things. Yeah, rah, rah, developer experience. We could be so productive. But without any details of how and why, it gets really frustrating. Hey, at least I didn't mention using uh, Kubernetes. Not once. <laughs> Not once. <laughs> Not once. No, because they repla- <laughs> Kubernetes has been replaced by AI. Yeah. Uh, also, by the way, I, I sort of chuckled when you said cloud workstations and you get this new thing. I'm like, yeah, except for the cloud workstations, they say are built upon Google's opinionated security best practices and not only enhances security posture, centralized managed IDE, but also mitigates exfiltration by preventing local storage of code. So that workstation, uh, which is an opinionated ser- service, does no access to the internet, <laughs> has a single IDE that you probably don't want to use uh, and uh, is opinionated. So it probably doesn't do anything you want it to do. So you just have a lot of paperweights out in the cloud yeah. that you can't use. So it's awesome. Good. Yeah, it's quality. Uh, but yeah, I know these articles are always are kind of sort of annoying. I don't typically use them all the time in our show because uh, they are sort of in that like very pie in the sky ivory tower. But uh, we don't have any other Google news this week and I felt bad. So, well, I, yeah, I mean, there's no judgment on the article choice. It's just I, 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 I wish there was an easier way, even for us to communicate out like how to get some of these things done because it's there's just so little information on here's what you need, here's the value of what you need, and just do these three things and, and expect this return, right? It, business is very complicated, but I feel like there's there's a lot of muddy water out there. It's always muddying the water. I'll get off my soapbox and <laughs> sit back down. Sorry. <laughs> oh, great. We're going to move on to Azure. <laughs> who is, back up on the soapbox. We're going to talk about AI, of course, because that's what Microsoft talks about every week. Uh, but this one actually we talked about a little bit uh, in the past. So basically, Microsoft's AI-powered co-pilots, uh, they say, will change the way you work, making customers more efficient while unlocking new levels of creativity. And while these transformative tools open doors to new possibilities, they're also raising questions. Like some customers are maybe concerned about the risk of IP infringement claims if they use the output produced by generative AI. So in this case, if they you know went and took something off of CNN and then they regurgitated it back to you and then you use it in your press copy and CNN's like, hey, you copied my shit. Uh, you know, what What are your legal liabilities? So to address concerns around this, Microsoft is announcing the new Copilot copyright commitment. And as a customer uh, they who uses Copilot services and the output they generate without worrying about their copyright claims that could be had, Microsoft says, yes, you can uh, use it. And if you are challenged on copyright grounds, they will assume full responsibility and the legal risk involved. Specifically, if a third party sues a commercial customer for copyright infringement for using Microsoft Copilot or the outputs they generate, they will defend the customer and pay the amount of any adverse judgments or settlements that result from the lawsuit itself, as long as the customer uses the guardrails and content filters we have built into their products. Uh, there are important conditions like those guardrails, recognizing that there are potential ways the texture could be used, misused to generate harmful content. So, and to protect against those, the customer must use the content filters and safety systems built into the product and must not attempt to generate infringing materials. So I can't go and say, please generate me a CNN article or CNN quote about this thing, uh, including... Uh, not providing any inputs to the cloud service that potentially infringe on a customer's thing. So there are some guardrails here, but overall, the fact that they are basically warranting the main open AI uh, backend or the LLM they're using to power Copilot uh, to protect you from any copyright infringement is a nice protection that I'm glad to see. There's some interesting cases, which I think this is is missing. I mean, this, this is all about, it generates some code that somebody else sets th- things that uh that you stole from them or you know copilot was trained on some copyrighted code there are other cases where what happens if um oh, oh first there's the the fact that you can't copyright um ai generated works it's not legally possible and so if you're using uh, ai to generate code for your you know for a product for your business uh it's basically unprotected so somebody else could copy it and run it and you have no claim whatsoever to it if you go to court and they say you stole my code, and I would know it was generated by AI. You have no, there's no possible um, uh, copyrightable content here, so that's that could be a problem for people. And the other thing is, um, you know, some you know competing companies building the same product using the same tool could end up with very similar or not identical code bases. So you know, who who wins in that case? We will find out. Yeah. <laughs> Those legal challenges are working through the <laughs> cases right now, but. Uh... You know, lots of uh, lots of case law will be coming in the next few years around uh, AI, how you can use AI, how AI gets data for its models, etc. I wonder, like the I'm I'm curious on why Microsoft is announcing this, right? Because it's a you know, sure Microsoft has an army of lawyers and they can represent it. Is, are they trying to build trust in the ecosystem? 
are they trying to differentiate themselves versus you know GCP or Open API? Like it's an interesting sort of offering to say like here's our copyright. Like we don't think you're going to run into problems, but if you do, here's our guarantee that we'll we'll take on that legal liability. It's a, it's fascinating to me. I think they want test cases to take to court and they want their name on them. Oh, hmm. I hadn't even thought about that angle. Yeah. Yeah. Because then they have a legal precedent in their name. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, you definitely don't want, you know, some Joe Smub running AI in his garage to be the, the, the first guy, right? Right. He's going to represent himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my, that's my cynical opinion anyway. <laughs> well, if you are excited about Defender... Uh, and you are we're looking forward to the new malware scanning capability. I'm pleased to tell you that it is now generally available. Uh, Woo! Azure is a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, malware scanning capability is a defender for storage. The enhanced security of this feature strengthens the security of Azure storage by detecting and mitigating malware threats, safeguarding data stored in Azure Blob storage and Azure Data Lake storage. It has real-time protection available to you all for the cost of 15 cents per gigabyte of data scanned, uh, which having to implement <laughs> controls around protecting object storage for mm-hmm. viruses. Mm-hmm. I'm just so glad this is built in because yeah. I wish AWS would get this. I wish GCS would get this because the, mm-hmm. the vendors you have to use, it slows down the transaction, it has to be in line. It's slow. It's expensive. It never works very well, in my opinion. Uh, and it's all a check, a checkbox with security. But if it actually worked, it could have value, but it just needs to be in once it gets into the bucket. And I've already returned back to the client that I have the file. That's when I like you to scan it and then quarantine it if that's a problem not in the middle of the transaction, which is not the right time. So now, especially if there's like the convincing people like uploads over multi threads and multi part uploads and like it's, it's confusing at the best of times. And then you're going to add this third leg in there like yikes. So yeah, this is fantastic. It just point me to the API that lists that we've scanned everything that I can give to my compliance team. And you just, you have to be careful because it's in addition to the standard defender costs and what that includes. So it's an additional scan. So it's kind of like AWS Macy where it's charged per gigabyte. So it does add up quickly, especially if you have like a high throughput, you know, storage count. Mm. Oh, so Defender does scanning sort of like at rest. Yeah. So Defender already already has a storage aspect to it where it does scan. um, And it's done based on transactions, if I remember correctly. And then this is in addition to that of gigabyte scan. So it kind of reminds me of like a Macy where it's like, we have some general mm-hmm. scanning that's mm-hmm. done. Here's your next level of scanning. Yeah, it's a good call out because, you know, I, I, I've been, I was burned by that initial Macy offering, you know, and it's one of those things where you think it's like, it sounds really cheap when you're measuring it at the per gigabyte per cost. And you're like, it couldn't add up to this much. Then, yeah. What happened? And then also it's just for blob storage. Storage accounts also include file share storage, so it doesn't include that aspect. I've looked into it a little bit already, in case you can't tell. <laughs> just, just a little <laughs> research was done. Uh, I mean, it'd be kind of nice if you could you know, build a JavaScript applet that, as you did it in the upload widget, that you just did the scan at mm-hmm. the browser side before you even shipped it. That seems like a better use case, in my opinion, for all of these type of solutions. Then you know, then you never transmitted it, you never had to store it. It was the file you just tried to upload is it has a virus in it. And then, you know, the user can deal with it on their side, which is where it should be dealt with to begin with. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing, because really, otherwise, you're forced to not encrypt um, the data before it hits the bucket. Agreed. Have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS, GCP, or Azure architect, only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiative stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution, Foghorn Consulting. Foghorn Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. Foghorn certified AWS, GCP and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOps solution even provides on-demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPod sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul and they bring their own juice. All right. Well, <laughs> hell has frozen over. 
officially. It's not I winter yet. It's not <laughs> Michigan. It's not that cold yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I, I guess technically it already froze over when Oracle yeah. and Microsoft got together and said, "Hey, we're going to connect our our clouds together," and you know, it's a cutesy thing to do. And you know, like, hey, who's a, who do we want to connect two clouds together with a piece of copper or fiber in this case? Uh, well, now they're further deepening the partnership built on top of that very robust partnership of connecting a cable between two data centers to now have Microsoft and Oracle are deepening their partnership to offer customers the ability to run mission critical database workloads on Microsoft Azure using Oracle database. Uh, So all your Oracle database workloads can run natively on Azure, which is what probably everyone always wanted to begin with, (laughs) not the ability to run it in OCI and then cross connect to your Microsoft Azure place. Uh, Microsoft and Oracle are working together to optimize performance, security and scalability for Oracle workloads on Azure enhancing the overall cloud experience. And the partnership includes joint engineering efforts such as optimizing Oracle software to run on Azure infrastructure and developing integrated solutions. And customers will have access to Oracle's cloud services on Azure, enabling them to leverage the strengths of both companies to meet their database needs in a flexible and efficient manner. Uh, And uh, yeah, there you go. That's the situation. Now, I also have the article for you from the Oracle perspective, if you prefer to read the Oracle side of it, uh, where they're saying Oracle and Microsoft are expanding the partnership. But otherwise, it's the same thing. Just switch the two words around. <laughs> uh, Oracle does say that the partnership will provide customers with a seamless and integrated experience. And the partnership includes that joint engineering efforts. And they mentioned security, which Azure didn't, which makes sense based on the track record <laughs> of Azure security versus Oracle security. So that yeah, makes sense. Uh, and then you also have ability to access Oracle's cloud services from Azure still through the other partnership we already mentioned. Uh, you know, the most interesting part of the whole thing about this is that Larry Ellison went to Redmond to have the announcement with Satya. Apparently that was his first time ever going to Microsoft headquarters in the history of the companies, which I'm just kind of, I'm just shocked. Like, I mean, like you never, you never went and met Bill Gates and like, I know you guys are rivals, but like, I always thought it was some mutual respect there. I mean, even Steve Jobs went to Microsoft and Bill Gates went to Apple. Like what? Interesting. Yeah. This announcement screams mutual (laughs) sure destruction to me somehow. I don't know the details, but um. (laughs) I'm... Well, the worst thing would be is if the Oracle lawyers taught the Microsoft lawyers how to lawyer, because then we'd be really in trouble. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oracle doesn't charge extra for Oracle running in uh, other clouds. I wonder if the, they'll reciprocate and let people run SQL Server uh, in Oracle for, for no additional you know, charge. Well, would they, would they allow them to get the... Because right now, it's basically, if you have a SQL Server license on Azure, it's four four cores. And if you're on any other cloud, it's two cores. And so if OCI gets access to that, mm-hmm. that'd be really interesting. And number two, the antitrust guys in Europe would have a field day about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the lawsuits out of that one is going to be real fast. So in Europe, they just do what they can, just like they are now. And in the rest of the world, they, they just get yeah. screwed. You, you know, is this one of those situations where Oracle was like, hey, we can't beat them, so why don't we just join them instead of fighting this this trend? And, and is this kind of just an admittance that, you know, yeah, some people are going to choose the OCI cloud, and that's fine. But, you know, if they really want to use these, we can make more money providing a, an Oracle-branded offering and solution supported by Azure. Sort of the same thing VMware kind of did. You know, initially announcing with AWS, so then a year or two later, they, they partnered with Microsoft and then GCP as well. I'm sort of curious if this walks across all three cloud providers over the next year or two. You know, maybe there's some exclusivity period for Azure, but um, you would think that GCP would maybe want to get on in this bandwagon too. Maybe AWS doesn't because they hate Oracle. That makes sense. <laughs> but uh, you know, I could see it ending up in other cloud providers as well. I think a lot of this has to do with customer base. You know, like I don't know if there's as much demand on the other cloud providers as there is on Azure. But maybe, maybe. Yeah, I would be shocked if AWS ended up with a partnership like this. I feel like there's so many programs that AWS offers to move out of SQL and Oracle specifically to anything else, any of the open source or preferably, obviously, from AWS to side Aurora, um, that it just feels weird that they would do it, though they still do have RDS with Oracle support. Yeah, I mean, they still run it over there. And and I think there was a there is some license agreement that allows AWS to run Oracle before Oracle realized that was a really bad idea. <laughs> so that's how they're able to do it. And GCP isn't. Um, and so, you know, mm-hmm. this isn't quite the same thing in my mind as what that is versus what Azure is doing here is at, this is a partnership where they're actually optimizing Oracle to run on top of um, Microsoft Azure. I don't know if that's the case with RDS. I think 
Amazon does its own work to make Oracle work on top of RDS. I don't think there's any partnership there. So that's probably the one big difference I see between the two contracts and relationships. Hmm. All right, let's move on to our cloud journey. So uh, this week, we're going to talk about platform engineering or cloud platform engineering or traditional platform engineering, golden paths, and the power of self-service. And this was inspired by this great article that Google posted, uh, unlike the other one from earlier. <laughs> this one uh, talked really about engineering execution consistency is crucial in software development for better collaboration and efficiency. Inconsistent practices can lead to issues like inefficiencies and reduce quality. And Google's Cloud's Golden Paths initiatives helps achieve engineering execution consistency. And Golden Paths provide recommended practices, tools, and documentation for different aspects of software development. Benefits of following Golden Paths include reduced complexity, improved collaboration, faster onboarding, easier maintenance, and better software quality. And Golden Paths can be customized to specific team needs while maintaining consistency with the standard. Google Cloud leverages its expertise to keep Golden Paths up to date. And adopting Golden Paths allows teams to focus on delivering solutions rather than figuring out best practices, which um, overall is a great aspirational thing. But I do think you sort of need to understand uh, your best practices before you just go deliver a solution. But maybe that's my take on it. Uh, but overall, you know, I think the key question here I thought we should talk about is really, um, you know, cloud platform. What is it? What is the difference between cloud platform and application platform? And then how do you guys see these golden paths or as I sometimes call them opinionated uh, you know, implementations or modules uh, and the, the ability to shift left with self-service? Well, I think that's the key, right? So as we've put more and more into shift left, as we've, you know, really taken an embodied DevOps practices, we've, we've put a lot of responsibility on these dev teams in order to give, to, to enable them, to, to let them own their own destiny. Uh, I, I really see this as a reaction to that as just, you know, teams are overloaded and overwhelmed um, and businesses are struggling to keep up when you have, you know, 20 dev teams all creating their own way of doing business. And you have, you have to somehow have an InfoSec policy that sort of understands all that and can, can vet the compliance or the security of it all. And, and finance is all, becomes a, a concern as well because certain things are going to be more expensive than other things. And so I think this is a natural reaction. I, I do think that this is great, right? Because it captures still the the sort of the power of self-service and really it's enabling that. And so golden path to me is is great as long as you're building something that allows for stuff that's not on the golden path. Um, you want to provide that self-service enablement. And here's your one way to do it that's very opinionated and you can do all these. But the minute you build a system where only the golden path is allowed, you're going to run into problems because then you're getting into service catalog territory where, yeah, here it's an easy button to to launch your you know th standard three-tier app, but I wanted to do this other thing over here and you don't have a button for that. You've squashed my innovation. So I think it's, you know, like I like this trend. I do think that it's... um going to be one of those things that sort of takes over and takes hold and it'll become ubiquitous for for software development yeah i like it yeah me too i think it, it solves one of the biggest problems for any any new employee or contractor is is the discovery problem well where do i go for uh where do i create a new repo oh it's we've got a github thing okay so create the repo well well how do i hook it up to Jenkins, or how do I use GitHub Actions to do the build? Or where does the artifact go? You know, how do I scan it? How do I do all these other things? And by providing this this cookie cutter template, even if it's just an example and you can tweak it yourself later, at least it's a great starting point. But yeah, I, I agree with the um, must allow deviation though, because so many tools sort of tout themselves as this is the, this is the best way to do it. You've got things like Rundeck or Pulumi or you know a whole bunch of tools where this this is the way. This is the way you're going to do it. And then you realize you can't use the tool. You also have to hack things to, to make them work the way you want because it didn't quite meet the needs as the business changes. Well, I, I think the mistake people make is they think Pulumi or Terraform or others are are a solution. And it's really, they're more of a Swiss army knife. <laughs> and you can you can put them together in ways that you can make repeatable service catalog type items that you can deliver to your business. But like that's part of what the cloud platform team would kind of do. And kind of going to that question, you know, be giving a service catalog, giving self-service capabilities, delivering opinionated Terraform modules or opinionated Pulumi, whatever they call modules. I'm sure they have something. Uh, I never used it. <laughs> so same ignorance there. Uh, but you know, those things are things that Cloud Platform team would typically build out and provide to the business as you think about how you kind of go through your CCOE and move into 
providing this capability to your dev team. So I think it's it's super important. But yeah, the tools themselves are just the tools. You still have to worry about how you said the architecture implementation. You have to think about what those opinions you're going to share are, and then how do you enable teams as your customers uh, and really drive that service mentality. So to get to the question about what is platform engineering and what is cloud platform engineering and what is product application engineering, I think that it's, I don't really know other than the differences in name that there is much, right? There's, there's concerns and specializations. I think that, you know, in order to leverage a cloud hyperscaler, there's still a lot of subject matter expertise in how bits get from one place to another, how, how authentication mechanisms work. Um, that may not really be the strength of someone who's been, say, a Java developer for ages or a .NET developer who's leveraged frameworks. And so there's there's just a matter of that, right? It's all just about you know the tech stack and the technologies in use. And I think that's the greatest thing about where we are in computing is that you no longer need to have this sort of like, only these people have access to the data center so they can do a thing. It is a platform now that is executed via API calls and codified and, and can manage be managed just like your application code. Um, and so the cloud platform just becomes, you know, these are the people that know how the direct connect peering works and to, to get two different things to talk to each other. Or these are, you know, how AD can integrate with an SSO provider. And it's, it's pretty great that way. What I would say is, and I've gone back and forth on this, is make sure that whatever you're implementing makes sense for your company, though. Like, it's great to build a platform to run containers or whatever you want to be doing, images and providing golden images or whatever you're providing for your end, end user, you know, whether that be development teams or whoever they are. But make sure you don't also over-engineer. Um, you know, I've, like, looked at my job and, you know, at one point I was like, oh, I want to do all these things. And I was like, wait, we don't really need all that right now. Like, so, you know, make sure you build what is appropriate and what will actually provide the business value. Otherwise, with a lot of these things, if you're building that platform and keep doing all those, you know, getting all those bits and pieces in place so that the logs go to the right place and all these other pieces happen, you know, it's actually going to be leveraged by your company. Yeah, I think you can get very... And well, very quickly, you move into ivory tower on platform, right? So you can build a bunch of platform things that you're not ready for. You don't need to. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, you need to build the services that make sense. And, you know, you can kind of you can put some rule of thumb in place like, hey, if we're, you know, we continue to build this thing multiple times in Terraform, maybe it needs a Terraform module. Uh, you know, we we need a common way to do secrets management and we need to be multi-cloud. Okay, well, maybe something wrapped around Vault makes sense. And that's a platform service. You get into observability and are you doing open tracing and Jaeger and, and some of those technologies or, you know, that becomes a service that you have to manage. And so maybe that becomes part of your platform team and they provide SDKs and APIs to enable open tracing in the application. So there's, you know, it's all driven by business need and what your business ultimately needs. And so I think the key thing is don't get too far ahead of where your customers are. You want to be ahead of them enough that they're not waiting, but you also, but you need to have also product management mentality where you're going out and saying, okay, what do you? What things do you need in engineering that would be make adopting the cloud easier for you? What are the things that you're thinking about in the next six months from now? And they're like, oh, you know, we're thinking about doing something with big data. Great. Are you thinking about uh, Spark? Are you thinking about uh, using L, you know, AI technology, etc.? Then maybe you go through the process of enabling uh, EMR, or you enable um, SageMaker or Vertex, for example, for AI. Those are your choices you can make, but you don't need to go build that in front and then go find a customer for it. That's the wrong way. You got to you got to start the other direction, mm-hmm. and then you also bring your engineering into that early adopter yeah, process too, and say, "Hey, you know, we're going to go evaluate EMR and Spark and these other solutions. Let's have you be a stakeholder in that too. So as we build the service, you're a part of the solution, and you and you want to adopt. Well, like any software product, you want to build it modular so that you can replace components. Right. And so it's you, you build some foundational primitives that you have, and you may need to build those before the business is ready because they won't understand the questions that you're asking. But you also have to build it in such a way where, you know, it's like when you get to that evaluation of like, yeah, we're, we're, we're empowering the use of SageMaker. And so here's our, our golden path for how you would get an environment to, to train a model or examine this data set or, or to run large queries. And 
you know, and then be able to sort of pick that apart and be like, well, maybe there's this other solution. Maybe, you know, the Databricks offering is, is more enticing because it does this new fancy whiz bang thing. And so being able to sort of quickly pivot and make those choices, just like you would as a software dependency using this library or that library for the functionality. And so you can do the same thing with cloud technologies and managed service providers, as long as you build the, the primitives, right. And as long as you kind of establish those, those sort of serp service boundaries. I think the one thing to really hit back on is what Justin said, which is you're playing product manager slash owner in this case, and really making sure that you understand what your customer needs are along the way. Because as a platform engineer, as a you know head of you know a platform engineering team or whatever your role is, that product mentality now that everything is an api call away hey give me 17 servers give me you know 14 terabytes of s3 storage or blob storage you know you're now a little bit more of a product owner building products for other parts of your company to consume you need to make sure you think about it in that way i think infrastructure has always needed that and i think we're a bit behind and i think that we we're now talking the yeah. right it, using the right words. And so we can start having that where there is a funded position for that, right? Where it is, there's not just playing the part of product. There actually is product decisions made. There's someone dedicated to understanding that. And I think that even when it was, you know, a, a network filer, um, you know, storage is a service. And so traditionally we haven't had that, right? It's like, can we spin the thing up? We turn on the network and we say, go, um, and, you know, someone asks how to use it. And they're like, eh, read the docs, you know, or, or we've given you the one line. And what happens when you run out of space? Well, I'll create another ticket. We'll do another one, you know, like in those types of things. And versus if it was managed as a service, you know, it would be that's you'd be providing that you'd be not only creating the tasks to spin up that network filer, but also the documentation of how to use it, defining out the user contract and the permission schemes for our back. How, how is it going to be monitored in uptime? How is that going to be communicated out? What's the SLA expectations of these things? Um, those are all product concerns that, you know, have traditionally just not been answered, but they exist. And, and a, a well-run business has visibility and insight to that. You know, whether it's fully funded, doubtful, but, you know, it's nice. It would be awesome. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts on uh, the joys of platform engineering <laughs> and golden paths? I, th I think platform engineering and cloud platform engineering for very similar roles, but I think mm -hmm. the, the important differentiator is that cloud platform engineers are, are, are sort of abstracting somebody else's services to provide a easy to use, sensible, compliant interface to the rest of the business. Mm -hmm. I think they become super important when you think about multi-cloud, right? Because if you're going to become multi-cloud and you're going to try to be cloud agnostic, you need to be able to build abstractions for all the cloud providers. And so uh, a cloud platform engineering team becomes one of the key enablers of being able to do multi-cloud. So if you're really big on the multi-cloud strategy, um, you can make your platform team do that, but you know they should be building things that benefit the product or a cloud platform team can be focused on how do we abstract away the clouds and just make it a commodity to the business. Yeah, and one of the things I'm I'm kind of proud of that, that that we've done over the years is is not just take a cloud provider's service and say, okay, this is how you do logging. You connect to you know Amazon's CloudWatch APIs. We're just going to do everything natively, and we just stand back and, and let people spend millions of dollars um, and not get value for money. So I think one of the one of the things that I'm proud of that we've done is to actually turn somebody else's services into a in, into an internal service with the controls that are needed. I think I think the service is an important thing because you could very easily just deploy a thing in the cloud and then pretend like it's in your data center and nobody maintains it, nobody touches it, but that's that's not the right path, I think. I think we need to ensure that people consume it as a service and not as some artifact that you've purchased and just sits there and does its thing. So we have to think about life cycles and um, you know, roadmaps for products and deprecation, perhaps, in, in the case of things. So those are all things that I think uh, sort of fall on the, the cloud platform's shoulders to, to make sure that the business understands. 
I've never seen a company use a cloud provider as a data center. What are you talking about, Jonathan? I've never seen a Jenkins build server abused for more than CI CD purposes. You know, no, never never. happens. DNS is a database. Yeah, I mean, what's wrong with DNS's database? <laughs> Great uptime. There's Nothing. even even have some SDKs that'll help you do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, have a great other fantastic week uh, out there in the cloud, and we'll see you next week. See you later. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. And that is the week in cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, and tweet us your feedback at hashtag the cloud pod. Or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. All right, well, it's time to pick on Ryan, because uh, <laughs> his former employer, uh, Yahoo, is back in the news once again for after. Uh, and, you know, we like to pick on Yahoo, mostly because it's the stalwart of the early early 2000s uh, and the dot-com boom and era and bust and uh, Brian worked there. And so oh. we like to uh, pick on his purple love uh, in some ways. But I don't think purple is really a color anymore. Is it at Yahoo? Is it, it still is. It's still it's still I mean, I don't know if it's as strong in the culture. We, I will say that we beat that over the head when I was there where, you know, like uh, in the IT closet, all of the Sharpies were purple, you know, and it was very strong. <laughs> Bleed purple, you know, it, it was, all, it was all there. Yeah. Well, the uh, the information had an article uh, called Can Yahoo Be Saved? How Apollo is Rebuilding an Internet Icon. Uh, and this is behind a paywall, so I apologize. I'm trying not to use as many articles from the information, although they have typically some good analysis. So this is one of those. Sorry. Uh, but, you know, Apollo purchased Yahoo in September 2021, uh, and they have gone on an interesting journey. The information uh, article ha- is all about Apollo and how they're doing it. And it uh, starts out strong with a really great quote. I always knew these products had seen better days, said Lanzone, the CEO of Yahoo, over a video call in late August. Even though they still have large audiences, they need to be modernized, pretty much every single one of them. Good job. Nice job on the tech debt, Ryan. We appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't argue with it. I mean, it, I felt <laughs> yeah. that way when I worked there long before uh, <laughs> he was the CEO, long before Verizon even bought. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Apollo, of course, being a PE company, has done the typical cut costs uh, from the business as all good PE does. Uh, but they made tough decisions with the businesses that were struggling or no longer able to keep up uh, with their competitors. Sales and key areas like ad sales have been off the mark 18% from $1.4 billion in the fourth quarter last year to like, I think one, just over $1 billion, which led over to 1,600 billion or 1,600 Yahoo employees being laid off. Uh, apparently, they're on pace during a $7 billion in gross revenue this year, down from $8 billion the year before. So it's still a contracting business. And they have sold several assets uh, to companies to help keep the company afloat including selling the branding rights in japan so if you go to japan yahoo japan is not not yahoo which was news to me in this article uh, as well as they sold their content delivery network edgecast and smaller assets like ip addresses which allowed apollo to return the entirety of its two billion equity investments to its limited partners and they plan to hold the company for apparently about five years the article goes on to talk about rebranding and rebuilding or not rebranding but rebuilding yahoo mail yahoo sports some of the many many uh yahoo assets that people love to use every day but really hate so what do you think, Ryan? Yahoo Japan was a different company when I worked there. Well, so they apparently I, sold the branding rights yeah. to them. Well, I mean, I think Japan has a bunch of regulations. It's yeah, it's really. I wonder what the details are there, just because it was that was always sort of a nightmare. Um, as a central central provider, you know, it was one of those things where we'd get a ticko ticket for why Japan. We're like, yeah, we can't do anything here. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's I. I'm rooting for the underdog. I think that, you know, Yahoo was in a crisis of identity while I was there from 2006 to 2014, where we flipped back and forth from trying to be a technology company to trying to be a a content provider and back again and back again. Um, And it was, you know, like you can see how it lost its way at the time. And, uh, you know, I was definitely a much more junior idea or junior um in my career and so i was along for that ride i didn't really have the insight and understanding of the business i just knew that modern automation was needed everywhere and so i just complained a lot um but yeah i don't know like i think that i'm always surprised when i see yahoo on the list of of you know page views it's still huge like they're still in the top 10 globally um 
And, you know, they're not talked about at all. You don't hear about them much in the U.S. I think internationally, they're, it's a lot more used and a lot more known. But, you know, you know, I, I, I still like their products. I still use it because I, I am still very loyal. And I, I think back in my time there very fondly. And I learned a ton that I've been able to leverage in my career. So I hope that they can, you know, I think it's going to take a little while to contract, but I hope that they come back and they come back stronger. Yeah, I mean, do you think it's, you know, one of the things I talk about in the article is that trying to get to the younger generation of customers. And so, you know, I was just thinking it's the, it's the boomers who are using Yahoo still as their homepage because uh, that's what they use when they first started using the internet and everyone else kind of moved on. And even when you get a new web browser, you know, back in the Netscape days, Yahoo was one of the prominent options you could choose as your homepage um, until Netscape realized they should be a portal too. And they tried to seal all that business away. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting, like, you know, I don't think my kids know what Yahoo is. Mm-hmm. So I, I still think it's an uphill battle, but, you know, marketing is a powerful thing. Well, I think the best thing they could do is go away so that when they do come back in the scene, it's new, right? <laughs> it's new. If it's just this old stodgy thing, like that's the thing, like in the U S yeah, it's only the boomers. I don't know if that's true globally, but yeah, like lay low for like a decade and then come back with a thing. And then, you know, people are like, Ooh, have you tried this new Yahoo site? That's a weird name. Oh, wow. They're so edgy and new. <laughs> it's like, have you, have you seen this show called friends? It's really edgy. <laughs> The 90s humor and friends isn't stand up. So it's a tough reference, but I get it. (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know, it's, it's sort of interesting, um, you know, cause I, I still go to Yahoo finance. I I've always liked the format of Yahoo finance. I don't pay for it. I know there's a plus version I can pay for it, but giving our money to Yahoo seems silly. Um, You know, but the question is, do you like it or are you used to it? Both. No, Yahoo <laughs> Finance is a is a solid product. They still have great insight in, in into you know different stocks and different performance rates. They still have a good set of tooling there, and it is still very popular. Like that's you know I would say that Yahoo Sports and Yahoo Finance are even and and then Mail, which is still very popular too. Like, are still good products. Sorry, I, mean, I know I'm I'm a little biased. I think the article said like 100 million views a. I assume it's a month. I don't know. For uh, Yahoo Finance. It, it's a lot. Uh, Yahoo Sports is probably another one of the big ones that's been you know, pretty popular um, you know, for sports scores and things like that. They have fantasy. Mm-hmm. They do. You know, people are into that kind of stuff. Um, so those are definitely draws to their to their portfolio for sure. And then, you know, the, people still go to Yahoo as their homepage because, you know, and I'll admit sometimes when I'm, you know, at a computer just trying to find something you know, after Google fails me, I'll try, I'll try pinging Yahoo because it always responds typically too. Uh, and then Bruce I realized it's my ne- I'd never, <laughs> I never go there. Yeah. Not even on the list. Like, uh, I, I, I get annoyed now that anytime I want to go try a Bing, you know, AI things from Bing, you had to go use like the edge browser and then to use any of the AI capabilities of Bing. And I'm just sort of like, yeah, you're not winning me over with this play. So I don't want you to do it. Yeah. I wonder if the top search on Bing is still download Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Real time research. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit that even when I worked at Yahoo, I, I did not go to yahoo.com as a homepage because it's always sort of horrified me. And so I just, while we were talking, I was like, oh yeah. And it's, I mean, there was definitely a point in the early internet where Yahoo was my homepage and cause it was the only <laughs> way you could actually use the internet because the directory was kind of awesome. <laughs> so before, you know, before Google existed and, and the ask Jeeves days and, Alta Vista and Yahoo. It was like, Yahoo was great. I used it all the time. I found what I needed. And, you know, the directory was kind of nice because you could like discover other companies through the directory. Like, oh, this is like five other companies I can go check out for this thing I'm looking for. Um, so, like, it, it had its place back in the early, you know, early 90s, uh, mid 90s, I guess, uh, you know, in the early dial up days. But, uh, you know, then it kind of lost favor. And, yeah, <laughs> you know, Google came in and stole all the thunder. That's how mm-hmm. it ended. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the, their ad technology and their ad sales um, never stood up to Google. Google really came in and revolutionized that space. They reinvented how you did internet over- advertising. And that's why Google is Google. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, Yahoo invented their thing, which was that how do you get around the internet um, and couldn't keep up in the ad space. And unfortunately, ads were the revenue generator. So, you know, they still make seven billion dollars a year right and it's they're still very profitable it's just still on the decline and you know it's 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 a weird business where you can make money and still get sort of like poo-pooed for for not being cool enough 
Well, it's between the article, they said that Yahoo Finance Plus, which is that paid thing I don't pay for, has over 2 million monthly users and is growing by double digit percentages year over year. And then they talk about, um, you know, they almost bought FTX, which would have been horrendous or yeah. some partnership Ooh, with they FTX. So they, they dodged that bullet. <laughs> yeah. <which is> nice. <laughs> um, and then, you know, they're, they are looking at selling still some individual businesses, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and making some more commercial deals. They did buy a company called Common Stock, uh, which is a retail investing forum for people to discuss stocks. Now, the reason why I like Yahoo Finance is because I, I enjoy going and reading what people are commenting on about stocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, it's always sort of interesting, like, oh, people have the same opinion I do, or they don't have the same opinion, or they're just trolls. I, I sort of enjoy that old legacy 90s forum <laughs> world of that. But that, that yeah, part answers, one, but finance related. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But that area has been kind of, you know, getting a little stale over the last few years and has really seen a lot, a lot of users. So I'm kind of excited for common stock as an acquisition. Like, maybe that becomes something that uh, makes it interesting. Um, and then they, they did talk about they did sell off part of their ad business um, and mm-hmm. are, you know partnering with different companies and investing in different companies. They're looking to buy the next, you know, the next version of their ad platform, which is probably the right thing to do because the one they have will probably take billions of dollars to reinvent, reinvent to be competitive with Google. Where if they can buy an up and comer and then throw Yahoo money into it, it mm-hmm. it's not a bad play for them. Yeah, it's I think it's the right the right call to divest in these things where they're not so strong and really focus on the things that they are strong. Um, you know, like, I don't know, like it, there's, there's a lot of things still within Yahoo that they don't need to be doing, you know, like, um, I, I thought it was interesting that they're selling off IP space because that was one of the things that I managed when I was there and we did have just boatloads of IPv4. And I, I love to see that IPv4 is such a scarce commodity that, you know, it's, it's an asset that's being called out in a news article, which is crazy. I mean, they're probably making a ton of money on it too, because they you know, they're because they're moving to cloud and they're like, oh yeah, you know, we could if you give us a sale on our, uh, you know, a deal on our Google or uh, Amazon account, we'll give you uh, you know some of our our IP or Google or mm-hmm. or whoever they're going with for their stuff. It, it might be a good play for them to be honest. Like sell that asset. That asset's worth a lot of money right now. And it, when IPv6 ever becomes popular, it won't be a valuable asset. So sell it now before it's too yeah, late. Exactly. All right. Do you- I think it's going to be tough for Yahoo because they they really have a brand recognition issue because, like you say, it's the it's the older generation potentially that that even know who they are or who they were, and I I kind of wonder like the 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 youth of today, the the children of today growing up with technology and having uh, devices and tablets with accounts on from young ages, whether it's Google or or, or Apple they're kind of growing up already sort of established in the ecosystem. And I wonder how many of those people will actually choose to pivot to a different mail provider after having the same email address since they were six years old or, you know, a different technology provider. So what, what do Yahoo really have to do to inject themselves in uh, to become relevant again to those people who already have kind of an established place in the technology world? And, you know, finance is great, but you can get, you know, there's Apple stocks, there's, there's finance, um, infinite finance news kind of all over the place. I think, I think if they're going to reinvent themselves, they, they need to, they, they need a new product or they need, they need to really appeal to people in a way that they haven't done for years. I mean, I think it's a marketing thing. Like it wasn't like a uh, Lincoln cars. They like, you know, we're always like that older generation and whatnot. And I feel like in the last couple of years, they've like redone a lot of their advertisements to like target younger generations and be like look how cool and sexy our cars are versus you know like hey this is what your grandmother drove type of thing so you know i feel like you know some of it's probably going to be taking on you know what their image is and just rebranding it and probably doing some sort of facelift because i don't think i can tell you the last time i actually went to yahoo.com and like being like look we've relaunched it's this whole new thing and it's targeted more at the younger generation and this whole aspect and it's going to be a multi-year, you know, migration path of getting, you know, retargeting the right, you know, younger age group. Oh, and I don't even think they're anywhere near starting no. that. Right? I think they're still very much in the phase of finding their strengths and identifying that and then making the business operationally sound. And I think that, you know, I think that being owned by private equity is probably the best thing for them. They don't have shareholders and and how volatile you know investors can be um to deal with they they have you know at least a a single point of you know 
of leadership that's going to be all about cost savings and return on investment. And I think they can slim that up. And I think if they define their strengths, then they can have an opportunity to capture a market where they're strong versus the divestiture of like what, you know, like they just spread way too thin, like yahoo.com, yahoo news, yahoo sports, yahoo finance, yahoo marketplace, yahoo. Like it was, there was, I don't even know how many properties that were there when I was there and it was just very large and they continued to buy more, right? We continued to expand. It's crazy. Maybe they should go for Yahoo AI. Maybe that'll be their. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they could, uh, they could build a yeah. new social is media it like platform. like Yahoo answers, but computer generated, like how <laughs> yeah. is Gabby formed? But like, well, but I, but I'm, I'm kind of excited because if it's Yahoo AI, then we can call it yay for short. And I kind of I feel that way about really? AI. So I'm sort of like, they yay. have the opportunity to be yay. And like it could be a thing. I'm just I'm putting uh, it out there. Like uh, if, if Yahoo's listening, yeah, uh, you can have that one for free. I have some contacts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, th- I think since Twitter's twelve months from absolute death, uh, they potentially could launch a new social media platform. That that would be a, p- a potential in for them. It's relevant to a lot of people. Yeah, it's always the question: is like, get, like, how much do I actually believe X is? X slash Twitter is you know, know close to death or not. I don't know if it's not. dead yet. You know, it's and it's just what was the Instagram offering for for that too? It didn't really take off. It, like, I, I mean, it had, its, it had its moment, and then it was twenty four hours. It, it was it was moment. like a week, and then people were like, "This is not really great." It, this is the yeah. risk of launching before your product's really ready. Uh, and I think the lack of a web interface and the lack of uh, common features that you had in Twitter really really a bad choice to launch a product with. I didn't realize it didn't have a web interface. It's hilarious. I don't know if it does now. I, I haven't looked. At, I, I lost interest as well. So, yeah. Wow, they had 300 million users in the first week. You know why? Because they popped up a box on the app that said "Try Threads," and everyone clicked it. Yeah, <laughs> all their Instagram users, yeah, right? Exactly. It was just like they automatically forced them to go over there. They're like, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I don't have anything else to say about Yahoo, other than I mean, they're a part of my youth. I want them to survive in some way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if they also died, I wouldn't care. But yeah, <laughs> I'd like them to make it just because I'd mourn their loss. I still have like boatloads of Yahoo swag and and stuff. Yeah. But I, and you know, I'm rooting for them. But you know, I think it's a it, it's a very long uphill battle. <laughs> just have to reinvent the next iPod. That's all. Ooh, no big yeah, deal. maybe they could get yeah. into a phone business. It works so well mm-hmm. for Amazon. They could build a phone. <laughs> go well. Oh, I forgot about the Amazon Fire Phone. Yeah. Uh, Amazon's uh, event was today. Is that still around? Uh, and I was I was sort of interested because Amazon apparently has a uh, asshole glasses. Ooh, nice! Uh, like uh, the uh, you know the their, their fire glasses with cameras built into them. And I was sort of the echo frames is what they're called. And I was like, oh, so we didn't figure out that glass holes were not a good idea. No, so. no one's learned anything. I mean, if anything, the VR trend is an extension of this. Like. We're just calling it something yeah. different. But they do. They do have some cool. They did have some neat stuff though in the Echo family. They have a new soundbar. If you're into soundbars, it's pretty cheap. Uh, they have the new new iPads, and then they had um, this new Echo Hub, which I almost bought already. <laughs> 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 uh, but it, it's basically like a home Excellent. hub that you know is basically a smart home control panel for all of your smart home devices, and it's compatible with. Um, two of the big standards in uh, home automation. So I was like, ooh, ooh I, I almost pit, I almost hit buy, but $180 yeah. was a little steep for what I wanted to pay today. <laughs> but uh, it'll wear on me. It'll, it'll get bought mm-hmm. at some point, I think, is what's going to happen mm-hmm. on that one. Yeah, as you've already brought it up twice, right? So that's, yeah. it's just going to it's just gonna fester from there. Yeah, because I'd love I to know. have like a device that all my smart homes, like light bulbs and switches and plugs, could just be available on a wall somewhere. That'd be versus trying to open the Amazon app, which is getting to be more and more of a tire fire every time mm-hmm. I open it, I think. So especially the Alexa app. Ugh. It's not great. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you're sharing uh, a, an intelligent household with others, right? Like there's things I can do that my wife can't do. Like, yeah. I'm so frustrated because it's my Amazon account. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll never forget the reason I turned off my, uh, you know, the, the home integration for, for, for power and stuff is because somebody said, okay, assistant, turn everything off. And it literally, you know, I had like smart plugs on refrigerators and, and all kinds of things. And it, your fridge turned <laughs> off. And your, it did. It turned. It turned. But why? Everything. But why yeah. did you have a smart plug on your fridge? Like, what was your? Did you have an intent the whole when you did it? Fridge was smart. Did you see his fridge? His fridge had a screen. Monitoring power. Mostly it was mostly it's for monitoring power usage. So my brother-in-law has it tied into his 
um, main, sorry, brains dying at nine, whatever we're recording, the main circuit breaker in his house. And over time, it's figured out what's what. So we can see when the fridge turns on and everything oh, else. Sense. I don't know what the product is. Yeah. Huh? Anyway. It's a sense. You could do it's that sense. instead yeah, and yeah. not I use thought, yeah. you know, cool. 17 smart plugs. Okay. Oh, he's got that. And, and so I do, I do have one. sense and yeah. sense is pretty good and at getting, getting some problem, things, so. but, um, it, it also <laughs> relies heavily on, on integration <laughs> with smart plug providers to, to get accurate mm-hmm. data on, on things. Mm-hmm. I don't, I think they had a great idea and the reality mm-hmm. is that it couldn't quite make it work as, as they'd hoped. I don't think the mm-hmm. data is clean enough for nah. them to label to do, to do the proper machine. No, nah, it's mm-hmm. not. I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty good about picking up like heavy users, like a plug of the car in Big, AC. Yeah. Pull pump, uh, microwave, uh, like things like that, which which have known known powers, and known pans. But so, like my laptop, it's not going to figure out. Yep, big motors with very specific startup sort of like needs, and then no, no. I mean, that's that's part of the thing with a uh, with digital stuff in general. It's not a distinct sort of uh, waveform that you can do machine learning on to identify. They also announced a new Eero Max uh, on the Wi-Fi 7. Uh, and then those glasses I thought were video, but they're only audio. Uh, but they, apparently this is the version 2, but they've never sold the version 1. So they And they haven't announced that they're going to sell the version 2 of the glasses. So I think that's what really yeah, Version 1 was terrible enough that it never made it into a press release. Yeah. One thing I did see I thought was pretty neat was um, uh, accessibility enhancements. So you could navigate around um, the home hub with uh, mm. eye tracking. So you know, if you don't have hands, or you can't move your hands, or if you can't speak or or hear for that for that matter. Well, that's not, that's yeah. a nice feature because my uh, mine is in my kitchen because that's where I put recipes and stuff when I'm cooking. Uh, and yeah, if I have my hands are dirty, it's hard to use. <laughs> so hand, you know, eye tracking would be kind of a cool feature for that. So, uh, but I noticed that it doesn't have it's not the one that moves. I'm the one that moves and follows me around the kitchen, uh, which I kind of like. And then the new one I saw was not that yet. But uh, maybe maybe that'll come in the future. Does Amazon have that? I thought Facebook had that, but I didn't know Amazon had one that will follow you around. Yeah, I, I mean, there was an effort. It was one of the Amazon shows, I think, at one point. I don't think they made. They stopped making it something that was very popular. But I bought one, <laughs> and it's okay. just on my counter, and it follows me around when I walk in the kitchen. It's like a little dog over there. <laughs> uh, oh, you actually bought one not, of those? Not Does the, it work? Not the Astro Robot. That's a different one. Oh, that's yeah, what I was yeah, thinking. No, of. I would not buy that. I, what's the utility of it? I mean, I have a single story home, so it would work out for me just fine. But um, I don't really know what I would use it for. So I, I never, A, it's expensive. And number two, I don't know what I'd do with it. So it's kind of the double. It's still buy invite only. I got, so I, I signed up for the invite and I got invited to do it and I didn't buy. <laughs> so it's not hard to get it through the invite process because I don't think a lot of people are interested. Hmm. But, um, yeah, for sixteen hundred dollars, it's a not a cheap yeah. investment. Uh, although, you know, in my life of technology, two things happened this week that I'm super kind of cranky about. Uh, first of all, the CloudPod Slack got moved to the new version of Slack's UI, <laughs> which I <laughs> absolutely it's, hate, it's hate with a passion. Uh, yeah, I have too many channels. <laughs> it's really, it's really terrible. The worst is switching between the old and the new and the whole interface switches and I can't handle it. I'm like, oh, it used to be here and now like, oh, wait, I'm in this Slack, so it's not there, but I'm in the cloud pod, so it's there now. It's been driving me crazy for like the last week. Well, and, and the, so, I mean, like, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have nine Slack teams that I'm part of. Uh, and, you know, like I'm realizing I'm missing messages because I'm not noticing there's a dot on one of the, mm-hmm. you know, and I have to go switch to the right one, mm-hmm. which is terrible. And, you know, when they first rolled this out, I got it rolled one of my like first like OG AWS was like the first one that got it. And I, so I sent them feedback and I was yeah. like, hey, I get it. I, I do like what you're doing with the idea of having, uh, you know, DMs and activities on the left hand bar. I get it. Makes sense. But you got to give me the option to basically have an additional column that I can optionally enable that gives me all of my channel lists back. And they literally mm-hmm. wrote back and they're like, yeah, sorry. We're not going to. Yeah. Like, Screw you, hippies. Uh, so. Just what I I will admit I ended up in some like in a search and couldn't figure out how to go back to home because I didn't realize I had to go all the way over, to, and then like all the way over to the left and find then the home and the DM and the activity buttons and find those there. I'm so used to that middle where the left was just all the Slack channels. That was a solid like five minutes of me yelling at my computer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that so that was one travesty that happened to me. 
Uh, I have one last Slack team that hasn't updated yet. And when that one changes the new format, I'm going to cry a little bit, but it's okay. It'll happen. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sort of in this opinion that at some point in the next 12 to 18 months, Slack's going to start charging for free things and we're all going to abandon Slack anyways. But <laughs> we're all going to move to Discord, which is a whole different UI travesty. Uh, yeah. That's a whole different day uh, problem. Mm-hmm. The other one is I upgrade to iOS 17. And um, why Apple decided they were going to move the hang up button to be with a cluster at the bottom of the screen in a phone call is ridiculous and uh, i hate everything about it and i don't like change apparently uh, i'm an old man <laughs> screaming at my phone going why i don't <sighs> you know i get it in some ways but i also hate everything about it. so i hope that maybe gets changed to me too but you yeah. know i've hated the uh, settings change they did to apple uh, mac os for the entire year and i thought they would make it better yeah. and they never did so i just i'm um, gonna have to get used to it they've had a lot of negative feedback on that phone thing so i don't think that's i think that's here to stay like there because that came up i read articles about that when it was in beta yeah and and it still rolled out and i have yet to receive a phone call so i don't know how annoying it is but that's how i mean we didn't have to call you tonight to come to the show so that makes sense i know received right? a call that's his weekly phone call he gets it's true yeah it's the one we call he gets um and then the other other yeah the other thing they did was they so like a year or two ago in safari they moved the the url bar from the top to the bottom and then but then they made it an option so you could put it back to the top because i was like what heathen wants that at the bottom which both my kids have at the bottom because Mm -hmm. they didn't know that wasn't a default that they could change and they just got used to it so now when i reuse their phones i want to throw it against the wall because i'm like why this is terrible (laughs) uh but they also moved the search option in the ios to the same lower level position by the keyboard and i'm like why like no one like i get that you want to keep it close to my thumb because you're trying to keep me from being carpal tunnel on my thumb but that ship's going to say already i'm pretty sure that's you know, we're all doomed for carpal tunnel on our thumbs at some point from all these smartphones someday. But anyways, I just oh, we'll just evolve or we won't we'll either have longer thumbs or no thumbs. I don't yeah, know which way we'll go. Kind of- yeah, they've moved, moving the search bar is super annoying. Amazon the Amazon app did that I noticed a few months ago as well. And it drives mm-hmm. me insane. I absolutely hate it being down there. I don't I, know why. I don't know why Amazon keeps changing their app either. Like that's also another one that drives me crazy because like I all I need you to do is give me a search box and let me search for what I want to buy and add it to a cart and hit send. Which is already a pain on the iOS because of revenue sharing bullshit. If you're trying to buy eBooks, uh, but everything mm-hmm. else you can buy natively in that. But then, like, then they move like my orders from like my profile where orders used to be to like this new smart thing at the bottom, and it's not. Oh, it's, it's a terrible location. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing. Like these, I don't know what's happened to UI in the last like two years, but I feel like oh, I know UI has we like, got old. We're no longer the target. Yeah, I was just saying we're all officially <laughs> old men yelling at cloud. Like that's where we're at. at least. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, and you know. <laughs> And I, I was complaining about another dumb thing. <laughs> All of our training at work comes in video form and I don't oh, want a video. A, All yeah. I want is like step by step, like what I need to do. Like, oh, I want to go open a new rec in our in our terrible HRS system. Great. Just give me the six steps uh, the, the you know, and the buttons I need to click and I will figure it out. But no, no, no. All of it's going to be in video. And then all the mm-hmm. videos are like six to eight minutes long and they have two minutes of filler at the beginning explaining to you what the video is going to tell you about. And I'm like... I know this is all for Gen Z and everybody who's younger than I am. And I hate all of you people. Like <laughs> why? Seriously. If you prefer video instructions over written instructions, I don't think we can be friends. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, I like your lovely people. I love my kids. They're young people too. And they like videos. And like, this is, this is the YouTube generation. So like video is going to be a thing for them. And I get that, but can you give me both? Like, do I, can I have both options? Why does it have to be one or the other? Like, Help my poor millennial brain out. I need a list of steps. My problem is I watch the video for I'm like, oh, they're not talking about what I need. I go do something else and I realize I now have to rewind because I've yeah. officially missed what I needed. It's really a common. Well, what happens mm-hmm. to me is that the video has so much filler because they're trying to pad out their videos because they need to get viewers, you know, they need to have durations in their views. And so there's so much garbage that by the time like my brain goes ADHD on that and like all of a sudden mm-hmm. I'm like off answering emails and like I'm like, why was I watching this video that's just <laughs> meandering on? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm trying to remember how to do this thing that I don't actually know how to do. And then I had to go rewind the video and uh, same problem. But or it moves on to like seven videos later through recommendations. And all of a sudden it's like a horror video of some kind. And I'm like, why are the people being murdered on my screen right now? I don't know what's happened. And it's like because I it just played in the background because I got distracted on other work things or other things I was doing. Uh, Seven videos played. So, so next week for the intro for the, for the podcast, we're going to be like, "Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about the, whatever." <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> I just press cringe. that like button. I just cringe. Yeah. Smash that like and yeah. subscribe button. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> hit that bell <laughs> for notifications. <laughs> All right, I think we've talked enough now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we've digressed. 
Yeah. For I, I just I just happened to click on Slack while we were talking, and I was like, yeah, you know what? I got two complaints I want to share with the listeners. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there you go. You know, and for those of you who are here at the very end of the show, you're the diehards, anyways. You care about my rants. Sweet Everyone Jesus. Else does. Yeah, we love you. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Have a great one, guys. See you later. All right, you too. Bye.